Good afternoon. Welcome to our Committee of the Whole agenda for Wednesday, February 19th, 2020. I'd like to call this meeting to order at this time and ask if there's any declarations of interest. Seeing none, I will move to community announcements. And um, just before I do, uh, Mr. Valchek, did you have a, um, an announcement? Uh, just a, an update, uh, Madam Mayor, for those that are in the audience and those viewing, uh, CAO Webster is absent with notice today, so I just wanted to put that on the record. Thank you, and you'll be acting in his capacity. Uh, will do. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, we'll move to community announcements. Um, perhaps I could start with um, Councillor Foster. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, just very quickly on uh, February the 11th, um, we did the presentations for the Hall and Landing Community Group for the Light Up the Landing event. Uh, Councilor Carruthers and I uh, were, were quite pleased at the way that uh, event went off, and um, thanks to yourself, Madam Mayor, for attending that day with us. Um, I wanted to mention uh, Monday, the Family Day event at the arena at the sports complex. Uh, lots and lots of people there. I was uh, quite pleased with the crowd that was there. Uh, the other thing that I should mention is this Saturday, February the 22nd, we're taking part in the coldest night of the year walk uh, in support of Blue Door Shelters. Uh, I believe we have, I think, about eight people on the team now. Um, I think we're sitting around $800 of uh, sponsorship, and it would be nice to uh, have that grow a little bit. So. Uh, that's a four o'clock event at the Sharon Hope Church, and uh, you can walk, I believe, two or five uh, kilometers. And uh, it'd be great to see uh, some more people out there. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Morton. Um, thank you, Madam Mayor. Actually, uh, I was on my way to the uh, chamber breakfast yesterday more, or the other morning, but uh, got waylaid by uh, a lady that had slipped off the side of the road. So I stopped to help her and missed breakfast but other than that i mean it was it was good it was for a good cause and um i was at the uh, family day over at the arena as well and it was well well attended and uh, i think certainly it's uh, going to expand as we move forward with it so that's it madam mayor councillor persicini good afternoon everyone i also had the pleasure of going to family day there seemed to be a lot of people there I sit at the car you find any parking, which is good exercise for me to go in the back of the parking lot. It was good. It was uh, well attended, and I got to see a lot of the people I haven't seen for years, and uh, it was enjoyable. I also went to the breakfast. I got up a little early and uh, skipped my exercise, and then there, and I did my exercise later. So it's all good. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Councillor Roy Di Clemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, looking forward to, on the calendar, uh, the Queensville Sharon Community Group is having their colossal pancake breakfast on March 22nd from 9 to 11. It's being held at the Temperance Hall. It's, uh, pancakes are being cooked uh, by Enbridge, so um, the, all the food safety uh, measures will be in place. Uh, no members of council will be near the food. And uh, on uh, June 11th, the uh, Sharon Temple is having their annual heritage celebration and tickets are now on sale for that lovely evening. Uh, so that's a couple of the things that my committees are working on. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Crow. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, I, I too attended the, uh, the Family Day uh, festivities at the sports complex on the weekend. And I have to say, I think it uh, was an even bigger crowd than last year. So. Uh, Special thanks to the staff and all the volunteers that made it possible. Um, looking forward, we have the uh, Mount Albert Lions maple syrup breakfast coming up on February 29th. It's from 9 to 11. Uh, and uh, we have uh, the East Willenbury and Georgina Women in Business Conference. That's uh, March 6th, and tickets are $75. And I think it's going to be quite an event. That's it for me. Thank you very much, Councillor Crothers. Thank you. It was nice seeing everyone at uh, Family Day. I was there manning the uh, Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Council table. Uh, we combined two themes, Family Day and um, 
Valentine's Day and uh, had some coloring sheets for the kids uh, called Love Makes a Family and a number of uh, parental resources and books from the library about uh, family diversity. Um, also with uh, the Diversity and Inclusion Advisory Committee, uh, as you know, this month is Black History Month. Um, we've been working to secure an author in conjunction with the library and uh, decided it was better to wait until next month where we can get two authors. So Black History is every month and not just February. So I uh, look forward to those dates. We'll be getting those out to you soon. There'll be two authors speaking next month. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I attended uh, several of the events that uh, our members have spoken about already, but a couple that have not been spoken about. I attended the Friends of the Library author reading uh, Anthony Dessau. Uh, it was a wonderful evening here. The council chambers were almost full. And uh, the, uh, the Friends of the Library host this uh, quarter, quarterly. The funds raised uh, go back into our library, and they wanted me to be sure and thank staff um, how much they appreciate the town's support for the council chambers and their events, and, and they asked to be shared with, with staff and uh, council. Uh, February the 7th, um, with staff, I met with Caroline Mulrooney. The purpose of the meeting was in response to Council's resolution passed to present Caroline Mulrooney with an overview of what the provincial modernization funding was used for. Presentation was delivered by staff Laura Hanna, Director of Communications, and Tara Levja, uh, Deputy Clerk, and it was very, very well received. Um, I. Um, Yes, I, that's all. I have a couple of uh, upcoming, um, the, the coldest night, as um, Councillor Foster has talked about in our walk and supporting the Blue Door Shelter, which is in our community. And uh, Saturday, February 29th, Mount Albert Lions are hosting their annual pancake breakfast, 9 to noon, at the Lions Hall. And hope to have everyone out there. Thank you. And with that, I will move on to um, presentations. And Mr. Clerk, could you please introduce our presenter? Thank you. Through you, Madam Mayor, your presenter is Moise Bahar, Senior Consultant with MBPD Limited, making a presentation in committee regarding the parking lot and drive through urban design guidelines. And this is actually in relation to item F1 on your uh, committee agenda today. Welcome. Good to have you with us today. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the committee. Um, thank you for the opportunity to present this afternoon. Um, I will be speaking to you today about our work on the urban design guidelines. I'm an urban planner and an architect and the senior consultant at Mbehar Planning and Design Limited. With me is Tejinder Sidhu and our landscape architect, uh, Graham Taylor uh, of Adesso Design Inc. We have had a, uh, a good amount of coordination and consultation in the upshot that you see today, along with staff and our team members. Uh, in terms of this uh, presentation, um, I will be discussing the purpose and intent of the document, the scope of work, an overview of the policy context, as well as I will show you some sample guidelines. The, the document has many more, but I will give you, in a way, a taste of each and every theme. Next. The purpose of these guidelines is to provide town-wide direction for the design of surface parking lots and drive-through facilities. These guidelines, we believe, will help implement the town's vision of a sustainable and pedestrian supportive community with specific application in this instance for drive-through facilities and parking lots. Sustainability, Madam Chair, speaks to a compact transit supportive built form and reduced impact on the environment that minimizes energy and water demand. Pedestrian supported urban environments consist of highly high quality walkable streetscapes that contain site and building features that enhance the private and the public realm at the same time. Next. Over the past two years, we have been working on the guidelines that consisted of four phases. 
Starting on February 22, 2018, and later on at May 10, 2018, we had consultation meetings with the Stakeholder Advisory Committee, SAC, to obtain feedback on our draft documents. In March 2018, we also prepared a background policy report that looked at various different instances, similar guidelines were applied in various municipalities. And on April 10, 2018, we presented the draft guidelines to council for feedback. And on June 5, 2018, the town hosted a community public open house. And we are now currently in phase four, where we have finalized our urban design guidelines and have shared them with the town staff. And now we are sharing them with you as the committee for your consideration. Next. In terms of the background uh, report, we prepared this report which established best practices for the design of these facilities. We reviewed the best practices, which were based on a review of policy framework, case studies of other municipalities, an inventory analysis, and, we feed, and the feedback we had heard at the SAC meeting. Next. Now I want to talk about the themes around which we organize these guidelines. Seven key themes. Streetscapes, parking layout and buildings safety, comfort, and pedestrian-focused design, sustainable development, landscaping and buffering, lighting and signage, servicing and utilities, stacking lanes and queuing, which of course apply to the drive-through component. And as I mentioned previously, I will show you some sample guidelines uh, for each key theme, and, uh, and they will be coming up in the next slide. In terms of the streetscapes, parking layout, and buildings, this is the first theme we have established. And as an example, guideline six, it discusses how the main entrances of the buildings are to be designed so that they are accessible and visible from the sidewalk and the public street. We note that false entrances and reverse lots for buildings should be avoided as they do not address the street and therefore do not create the pedestrian supportive environment that we believe is important. For example, Boston Pizza is located in the town, is an example. It has a main entrance that is directly accessible from the sidewalk. Another corner site example, which shows how a building comes out to the street, engages the street, and has the entrance from the street. Next. In terms of a second slide on the same theme, guideline 14 encourages the use of architectural features at key locations within surface parking lots. The image on the left is the gateway feature located at the pedestrian entrance of the parking lot at Young and Green Lane intersection. All of you know this. Another example is of an architectural feature in the parking lot at the Northeast Quadrant, again, of Young Street and Green Lane. These are the kind of gateway features and, um, and, and, and ways of creating spaces within parking lots that kind of go beyond just asphalt. Next. On the theme of safety, comfort, and pedestrian-focused design, this first slide uh, shows how, for example, as a guideline 34, how dividing large parking lots into smaller and well-defined sections on the site that use hard and soft landscaping. Again, we're trying to get away from ubiquitous large asphalt. We want to break them up, introduce green spaces within them. The site plan on the right shows how these guidelines could potentially be applied to, to such large parking lots. Again, what we're looking at is planting walkways that, again, 
time and again are connected and relate to the buildings that in most every case is attached to a parking lot. Next. Continuing with this theme, guideline 44 relates to using canopies, awnings, or building overhangs and cantilevers for weather protection along the frontage of buildings and their entrances. The image on the right shows how both guidelines can be achieved. Pedestrians are shown under the building canopy, providing pedestrian comfort and protection from the weather. Street furniture and planting is shown on the walkway where they can be placed in a consistent and coordinated manner. Again, the idea is parking lots and buildings, pedestrians, planting should work in harmony together to create kind of environment that avoids the sterilized parking lot feel. Next, a big part of our guidelines also concentrate on sustainable development. Under this guideline theme, we have provided some examples here for you to see. Guideline 48 uh, notes a minimum width of three meters for landscaped islands so that enough soil volume can be provided for them as plants to thrive. In that case, we also specify a 15 cubic meter of good quality soil. Guideline 50 discusses the incorporation of heat island reduction measures, including tree shading and permeable pavement. And again, the image on the right shows a landscaped island with a minimum width of three meters. Madam Chair, one of the things that we have tried time and again is to make our document very graphic rich so that there is these illustrations to accompany the text. Next. In terms of landscaping and buffering, um, guidelines 63 and 65 that we have used as samples, they detail requirements related to the type of landscaping to be used in parking lots and drive throughs Guideline 63, 63 discusses a mix of coniferous and deciduous trees and shrubs on the site for year-round vegetation, variety, and color. Guideline 65 is specific to coniferous tree species and notes their benefit in screening parking, servicing, and utilities. The image on the right, as you can see, shows that such a mix of trees and shrubs providing variety and color on the site and a lit pedestrian walkway. Again, pedestrian safety is one of our key uh, components running right through the guidelines. Next is lighting and signage. Uh, guideline 68 requires pedestrian scale lighting along walkways at building entrances where, and where applicable transit stops. Guideline 71 provides direction regarding fascia signage and encourages signage that is in, pro in proportion with building mass and facades. And the photo on the left shows pedestrian scale lighting along walkways. And photo on the right is of a parking lot in Squillenbury that has fascia signage proportionate to the building. We believe, Madam Chair, time and again, that parking lots, drive throughs and buildings make one environment, that they all have to be connected and coordinated to ensure sustainability and pedestrian comfort and safety. Next, in terms of servicing uh, and utilities theme, guideline 75 requires that the location of loading and garbage facilities be at the rear of the building, away from the street edge, and within the building wherever possible. Guideline 77 notes that utilities are to be located within enclosed areas, screened by landscaping with limited or no views from the street. And the photo on the slide shows how such a loading area is enclosed within the main building mass. Next, we've also provided a stacking lanes and queuing, uh, which is of course specific to the drive through facilities. Guideline 84 requires that vehicular access points to a stacking lane of a drive through facility it should be located as deep within the site as possible so queued vehicles do not block traffic along public streets. Guideline 86 
discusses the design of stacking lanes. Stacking lanes are to be clearly separated and follow a format with minimal curves and turning movements. And in this image, we're showing how this kind of guideline uh, can be applied in a visual uh, kind of example. And uh, Madam Mayor, this is the end of my presentation and welcome your comments and questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. It's uh, a pleasure to see that some of your examples include good things that have happened in East Squillenberry. And I think uh, back to some of those discussions that were here, and I think it was they were um, planted in this council chamber. So uh, thank, thank you. you for thank you for using good examples within. Uh, questions from members of committee. Councillor Crone. Thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, through you to our presenter. Uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, sharing uh, your information with us today. <clears throat> One thing that uh, came to mind uh, when I was reviewing it, uh, and, and I, I love the idea of having more green space and, and uh, trees and, and whatnot in our parking lots, I think, I think we can all agree on that. It's what sort of recommendations do you give the, the contractor to prepare the ground underneath the trees? Because if you don't have enough proper soil for them to grow in, it, they look nice and green for maybe a season or two, but then without the proper soil underneath, they will eventually die. Um, what sort of guidelines or advice do you give contractors in that regard? Just curious. Yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, one of the key things that uh, we have mentioned, uh, it, which is also a landscape crossover into sustainable development, is that, uh, and we work very closely with our team and, and our landscape architects on the team, that a minimum of 15 cubic meters of good co quality soil is, is the piece that, that will ensure kind of a healthy growth of the, of, of the landscaping. So that's a very specific requirement that we know from experience as our landscape architects have indicated that would ensure good growth. Councilor Crothers. Thank you. Um, looking at uh, your last slide, well, the one right before this where you talked about the drive-through. Yes. Um, I worry about pedestrians in this sort of situation. So anyone trying to uh, walk into the store um, would have to cut through the drive-through. And I think that that's something that, that's very important um, when we're talking about pedestrian safety is ensuring that they don't have to cross the line of traffic at the drive-through. Yes, yes. If I could just take my uh, clicker, perhaps I can identify it a little better. Um, I can, oh, you had it? Oh, this one? Okay, okay. I got my own little handy-dandy one. <laughs> uh, so, so one of the things, uh, uh, Madam Chair, through you, you can see the walkway that we are indicating through to come in to the entrances that we are, of course, uh, uh, kind of making sure that they are located along public streets. So there is that link that we are clearly showing that should be incorporated into any drive through So the people parking in front of the restaurant would have to walk all the way back and still cut across the traffic to get onto there, unless they park in front of the neighboring store. Okay, so, so in this instance, um, we have the public street across here. Mm -hmm. The buildings are located, as we would recommend, along the street. Mm -hmm. People parking in the back, let's say they are going to the restaurant, mm -hmm. so they would be walking either through here mm -hmm. or through here and across into the building. So the people parking in front of the restaurant do not have you a safe here? way, yes. They do not have a safe way to access the restaurant. Well, we could also look at this as a, as a link. You can see this link along here for that side. You can see there is another walkway coming right across here. Okay. I, I think that one of the guidelines should, be, uh, should speak to the safe access that, yes. that pedestrians should not be crossing uh, the, the drive through. Yes, definitely. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Councillor Roy Di Clemente. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I can either do it through here or when we bring the staff report forward with the actual document, but uh, I wanted to echo the uh, concern that Councillor Carruthers has raised. I think that's something that I've raised pretty consistently when we've been talking about that, is making sure that pedestrians do not have to cross active lanes of traffic in order yes. to access buildings. And uh, that was one of the main reasons why I voted against the site plan for one of our existing uh, uh, buildings here in, in East Gwillimbury was because there was no way to access the restaurant except by crossing through the lane of, of uh, drive through traffic. And generally, uh, when people have picked up their food at that pickup window, that's when they hit the accelerator. And that's when, personally, as a pedestrian, I feel the least safe. Yes. Um, and I think, uh, I think it, 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 it is appropriate for it, for that issue to have its own guideline. And I didn't see it and maybe I missed it because there mm -hmm. were 92 of them, um, but uh, I didn't see a specific guideline for that. And I think the other piece of it would also be, I guess, for the ability for us to sort of forecast where pedestrians will try to cut through those landscaped islands. And I think, uh, you know, we've all been to those commercial plazas where there's a, a footpath that's cut through the day lilies or a footpath that's cut through the shrubbery, no matter whether they're barberry or, or not, uh, just because it's, it's, it's the path of least resistance. And so while a great deal of effort has gone into the landscaping, uh, pedestrians would be cutting right through that landscape buffering in order to, to get closest access to that, uh, to that restaurant. So I think anticipating where those pedestrian crossings will take right. place I think is is really important in uh, in dealing with that. And I, and I had a few others, Madam Mayor, but I, I think uh, I'll wait for the, the full report to come to us. Thank you. Thank you. I'm I'm certainly in agreement with with Councillor Roy De Clemente, and and uh, unfortunately. Uh, for East Gwilmbury, we do have some that are a bad example mm. uh, where people have to walk right through the drive through lanes to get to the front door, not even a sidewalk or whatever it is to the front door. So so uh, I know that there are a number of people up here that are, have kept an eye on mm. that, and we have seen uh, some very close calls some days uh, at, at some of our restaurants. I wanted to talk just a moment about snow mm. plowing and salting uh, when we have... Um, greenery and how how we work with our snowplow uh, operators. We have operators here uh, that work for us, but those are not the ones that would be plowing within the um, these private parking lots. They will be private operators. Mm -hmm. And I know that uh, the Conservation Authority has been working diligently with the, the amount of salt that goes down and the kinds of things that they're using. But could you just comment on on that, uh, both, both on the smaller parking lots that are uh, self-contained. Uh, we many times see some of the mall lots where they they start on one side and then they're 10 minutes before they get to the other side and they're back and forth. And, and, and this uh, is, a, is a very different mindset of, um, of nice landscaping and, and a softer parking lot. So how, how do we work with the people that actually maintain these facilities? Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting one, uh, Madam Mayor, because this also came up in our uh, kind of uh, meetings that we had with the, uh, uh, with the kind of stakeholder advisory committee. Um, there are certain things that the guidelines can do in directing where, sh where things should go. Um, but there are, um, and, and then we can make sure that, for example, that where snow is stored and, 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 and of course it has salt in it and so forth, that it stays away from the landscaped islands. Uh, but there's a certain amount of limitation what guidelines can do in ensuring maintenance. There is a certain limitation to that because guidelines basically are used in the, uh, in the, yeah, yeah, guidelines are basically used part of the site plan review process that then ensures that every case, as we know, in an application, development application, is specific. But there are some commonalities to them. So what happens is that they get um, very specifically applied to each and every application. And as my colleague just uh, showed, guidelines 52 to 55 deal with some of the snow storage matters. Uh, for example, 54, allocate areas for snow storage away from the street edge within the parking lot. 
Consider areas such as overflow parking, bioretention areas, and areas that receive adequate solar radiation to melt the snow. So this is the kind of guideline that staff in the municipality would look at and deal with the applicant on a specific basis based on their layout to work with. And again, guideline 55, ensure that the area for snow storage does not conflict with site circulation, landscaping, natural heritage, hydrological features, vegetation, protected zones, and utility boxes. So, so again, guidelines will pave the way for staff to look at the specific development application and then apply that to ensure that these guidelines can be achieved. Thank you very much. It, it, we, uh, if we were having this discussion in July, uh, we might not think about it much, <laughs> but uh, we certainly do on a day like today. Thank you. Any other questions at all? Councillor Foster. Just a quick comment. One mm -hmm. thing that wasn't uh, mentioned uh, in your presentation, and I don't know if I saw it in there, I don't think I did. Um, it, it might be advantageous to actually mark some exits. Uh, we like to compartmentize these uh, parking lots and I'm not going to lie I found myself driving around a couple of times and thinking I can't get out this way um, so I, you know something like that might uh, uh, be worthwhile you know a clearly marked exit from that particular little segment that you're in thank you madam chair through you definitely this is an interesting one to kind of wayfinding signage that I believe that's the the councillor is mentioning that definitely could be incorporated Thank you very much. And seeing no other questions, could I have a mover for the presentation, please? Councillor Persicini, all those in favor? And that's carried. Thank you very much. We're going to deal with your uh, the report momentarily. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item number E is deputations. And Mr. Clerk, I have none listed on my agenda, correct? Correct, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. And we will move to item uh, F, and that's Councillor Crone in the chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have uh, one item on the agenda today. We have Development Services Planning Branch Report, E2020-01, Draft Parking Lot and drive through Urban Design Guidelines. Mr. Ramuno, would you like to uh, give us an update on this? Thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so following the presentation, um, We've heard some uh, some very uh, valuable comments from from council, and the the intent here was uh, to bring the uh, draft guidelines before council uh, for one last opportunity for review and comment. We've also posted the draft guidelines on a town's website, uh, which is open for review and comment as well. I think we've uh, we're going to keep it there until the end of March. So the goal here is subject to council direction, uh, taking in comments that we've heard uh, in the past uh, here today and for any future comments from the public uh, we're in a position to come back likely uh, uh first cycle in april uh with a a, a final uh a draft uh, set of guidelines incorporating all the changes that we've heard to date for council's consideration um again as we've heard um we initiated this uh, project, I mean, before my time and also before some of the members uh, who were sitting on council here back in late uh, 2017. There were a number of uh, stakeholder meetings uh, between staff and other agencies in the development industry. We also held an um, uh, open house and a council workshop. Uh, so there was some um, uh, significant public consultation uh, that led to this date. But again, subject to any additional comments from, from council and, uh, and the general public, uh, we can then finalize the uh, and make any appropriate changes for council's consideration in uh, in early April. We've take I've taken some notes based on some of the uh, interesting comments we've heard uh, here uh, this afternoon, and we'll certainly work with uh, uh, staff and our consultant team to make any uh, any changes uh, that are necessary. Thank you, Mr. Ramuno. Can I have a mover for this, please? Moved by Councillor Persicini. Do we have any questions? Councillor Wright Uh Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I've got a, a couple. One, I, I, one is a sort of a high level one uh, with respect to, um, I guess, the weight that these guidelines have uh, for applicants. So, you know, a landowner comes in, has a, has a proposed site plan. Uh, how closely do they have to adhere to these? These are great to have as guidelines, but 
uh, is does this give us any standing to say no? We're we're not going. We're not voting in favor of this, or we're not in we're not in support of this because it doesn't adhere to our guidelines. What what kind of strength does it give us in that planning process? Certainly through you, Mr. Chair. Um, again, the, these are gui only guidelines. Um, you know, in the, in the framework of things, Council, uh, we really have our official plan that sets the policy for 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 development uh, generally throughout the town and our zoning bylaw. But um, you know, the guidelines would be a good tool moving forward. So our not only our applicants, our development industry, but our staff can will uh, use those guidelines when we do get a uh, an application to ensure that they. Uh, they try and address those uh, key themes within the guidelines. Uh, ultimately, though, um, you know, in most of these situations, there'll be a formal site plan application that will be presented to council. Uh, we will address in the in the site plan, you know, how the uh, the application has uh, adhered to those guidelines. But ultimately, you know, it's still up to council as a final decision maker to. Uh, you know, say yes or no to an application, or send it back for additional uh, review and uh, and changes based on um, you know the application before council. But again, they they are a set of guidelines that are a, a valuable tool uh, for staff and in the, in the industry, so they know that council has endorsed a set of guidelines, and these are some of the key themes that need to be addressed when you're developing a uh, you know commercial park lot, more specifically the uh, a drive through facility. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, if, and further to that, I guess guideline number seventy-eight references that uh, that drive-throughs wouldn't uh, would be discouraged in uh, centers and village core areas. And it was my understanding that they were not permitted, according to our official plan, in those areas. And so I would make sure I would want to make sure that uh, that there was an agreement, or maybe I'm mistaken, but I want to make sure that those documents do agree. Mr. Romano. Um, certainly, we'll uh, we'll definitely take a look at our official plan. Our official pl our official plan does uh, use the words, if I'm not mistaken, um, you know, discourage within um, uh, within I believe it's the uh, the centers or, or quarters, but we will or village uh, core areas, but we will uh, verify that when we do report back to council. Um, and then uh, the final tool is is our zoning bylaw currently. Uh, in most instances, uh, drive-throughs are only permitted in one zone. So, in all likelihood, um, a drive-through facility would require a, a zoning bylaw amendment if it is in, if it isn't in the current uh, MU uh, seven zone, which is the only zone that currently permits drive-throughs as a uh, as a right. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. Um, the other one that I had, well, there was two actually. One was just uh, making sure that the roundabouts are actually wide enough for some of the delivery trucks to make it around them. Uh, there's a couple of uh, instances I've seen where you can see tr truck tire marks uh, in in the the mulch of the the middle of the roundabout because it's just certainly it's certainly not large enough for um, for vehicular circulation of the larger vehicles, not necessarily a passenger vehicle. Uh, and the other one with, with, that I had uh, was with respect to guideline number 79. Uh, it references that, uh, uh, that only one drive-through would, uh, would be suggested per site, uh, and that uh, if there was a larger, over one hectare site, uh, that, they, that, there be a dist that there be a uh, that that it be considered because it was a larger site. I'd, I'd like to be a little bit more specific on recommending that there be a distance separation. So if it is a large site that's 10 hectares or whatever, um, that that we're making sure that there's a distance that separates them and that that. Uh, We've seen we've seen the challenges that happen with two drive-through restaurants that are side by each, and uh, the the um, inter the interference between each other. So I would I would just suggest that we amend seventy nine to include some kind of reference to uh, having a distance between them if more than one is on the same site. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Uh Councillor Carruthers, you had you had a question. Yes, thank you. Um, further to the uh, drive-through um, and pedestrian crossing, I would hope that the um, picture that's included in the document that that I don't think is a, a best example of um, the same same picture was in the um, presentation where pedestrians have to 
to cross from the parking lot across the drive through lane. I think that uh, there's many other examples out there where the drive through goes along the side and across the back. That would be a better illustration of, of what we are looking for. Um, I just think that uh, it's fine that the sidewalks run down the side, but um, I think habit of people will be to go right from the parking lot in the middle straight to the restaurant. So uh, I don't think that is a very good example. Also, uh, this document is entitled um, parking and uh, parking lots and drive through, but yet we don't spend a lot of time talking about the drive through. I know Ottawa has guidelines and there's I think 50 guidelines just pertaining to drive throughs. So I think if we're going to have a document that's both parking lots and drive throughs, we need more than just a handful of um, references to drive throughs. There, there is a lot of guidelines that should be put in place to avoid uh, some of the issues that we've seen in, in other drive throughs. We've all sat in drive through lanes and thought this should have been designed better. Um, so I, I would like to see uh, a more robust plan for, for drive throughs and perhaps drawing on uh, some examples from other cities that have more robust uh, guidelines on that. My other question is around uh, guideline 77 that talks about utilities uh, screened by landscaping. I think that is a, a wonderful and a great idea. And I'm just wondering um, if staff could comment on uh, how that applies to areas outside of um, you know, restaurants and that sort of thing. Right now we have two hydro facilities in um, one on Young Street and one on the second session that uh, are just such an eyesore uh, because they're not screened. Um, and, you know, do we have any way of, you know, speaking with hydro to um, look at getting some screening in that? I know these guidelines apply to, to new developments, but um, just drove by those, both of those today and thought there's got to be something we can do because it really is an eyesore. Mr. Romano. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. No, these are, are great comments uh, with respect to the, uh, um, you know, some of these changes. We'll definitely take these back and, uh, and incorporate uh, um, all the changes that we've heard uh, suggested by Council today. With respect to the screening for, uh, uh, for the utilities on site, yeah, typically, I mean, these guidelines really uh, are meant to be the uh, driving force uh, uh, behind site plan applications but uh, when it comes to uh, some of our public utilities it's something that staff uh, senior management can uh, take back and have uh, discussions with our uh, utility providers providers to see if there's any uh, possibility to uh, for them to enhance screening uh, around some of these facilities thank you very much thank you are there any other questions councillor foster Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just a couple of uh, quick things, and, and maybe I just need an explanation. I'll go right back to guideline number two, where it says, encourage the provision of the minimum number of parking spaces required by the zoning bylaw. Shouldn't that be a little bit stronger than encourage? Uh, if it's a bylaw, it should be enforced. Am I reading that one right? Through you, Mr. Chair. Uh, no, that's a good catch. I think the intent there is, um, even though our, our zoning bylaw sets minimum uh, parking rates for these type of uh, uh, commercial developments, I think the intent of this policy is to uh, to avoid having sort of a sea of parking that in, in, in certain instances where the applicant um, will provide really just that bare, that minimum under our bone of zoning bylaw. So if the zoning bylaw says you need a minimum of 100 sp spaces, you know, stick to that as opposed to um, providing, you know, 150 to avoid that sea of asphalt. And that's something that we uh, regularly work with our applicants with respect to, you know, balancing, ensuring that they provide sufficient parking, but not uh, overdoing it because that just adds to the, uh, the sea of parking in the, uh, the asphalted area. And then, my next question would be regarding guideline 82, where it says, where appropriate, provide an escape lane. So the picture to the right of that, obviously you can escape uh, wherever you need to. Is that just referring to uh, um, drive-throughs that are curbed on both sides? It is, thank you. And the other thing that I, I just wanted to mention, a, a couple of times in here I read that uh, there was reference made to uh, car wash facilities. Um, and I, you know, where you talk about the number of vehicles that could be in queue, uh, I think about the one at Leslie and Gorham and quite often there's 25 cars sitting there waiting to get through. So 
that one might be a difficult one to handle. I'm, I'm not sure what answer you can give me. I just, it's worth mentioning. Thanks. Uh, if I, certainly through you, Mr. Uh, Chair. So this set of guidelines doesn't uh, apply to uh, car wash facilities. Uh, but again, when, when we are dealing with those in the future, it's something that we'll, uh, uh, we'll certainly try and address. And, and again, even this is a useful tool as well. Uh, there are some components with respect to landscaping and, uh, and uh, in and outs that uh, can be useful for uh, those type of facilities as well. Are there any other questions? Seeing none, can I uh, have a vote to receive this report? All in favor? Any opposed? See none, motion is carried. Uh, Mr. Ramuno, do you have any other comments you'd like to, uh, or updates you'd like to share with the committee? Uh, nothing further at this time, Mr. Chair. Okay, sorry. My colleague has uh, pointed out we've just voted to receive. Could, uh, uh, I'll ask that. Um, for the other uh, motions that we uh, that the uh, draft parking lot and drive through urban design guidelines are attached to this report be posted to the town's website allow for public and stakeholder comment review as well that staff report back addressing any comments received into the finalized version of the parking lot and drive through and i have a vote all moved by uh, councillor roy uh, councillor carruthers all in favor none opposed motion is carried uh any other questions uh from council to Mr. Ramuno. Seeing none, I hand the chair back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're under item G, and that's community infrastructure and environmental services with Councillor Crothers in the chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have uh, three items uh, before you today. Um, they're all good news. I will turn it over to uh, uh, General Manager Molinari to take us through the first one. It's pretty straightforward, so it should be pretty quick. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, essentially, the first report deals with uh, mid-crossing guard service provisions at Queensville Public School and Robert Munch Public School. Uh, earlier, uh, in the past couple months, the crossing guards approached uh, town staff and advised that uh, there were very few, if, if not uh, in some case, many cases, no kids crossing at lunchtime. So staff undertook a review and uh, quantified some of those, um, did a couple studies and, uh, and, and confirmed that uh, that kids were not crossing at those. So in consultation with the school board and the crossing guards, uh, we're looking to uh, remove crossing guard service just at lunchtime, uh, the morning and, and afternoon uh, provision for guards would remain in place, but uh, looking at removing the crossing guards after the March break um, with the provision that uh, if, uh, if, if we find that there is a demand for kids uh, to use those in the future, we'd apply our warrant analysis and, uh, and reinstate those guards. Thank you very much. We have four uh, resolutions before us. Can I get someone to move those? Uh, Councillor Morton, any questions? Seeing none, uh, we're voting to receive, to authorize the removal of the midday crossing guards and to delegate authority to the general manager to reinstate if necessary, and that the report be ratified at tonight's meeting in order to facilitate notice of the change in advance of March break. All in favor? That's carried. Next, we have a report on alternate, alternate locate agreements. I'll have to hand that over to you, Mr. Molinari. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is another um, a, agreement or report that we're looking to enter an agreement with some of our utility service providers. Uh, it's really an efficiency measure uh, that would allow the town staff uh, and the utility companies to operate in a little bit more efficient manner. Essentially, when, uh, right now, when a utility company needs to go in and do work, uh, the town's required to go and, and install uh, locates in the field and process some administrative paperwork in order to facilitate that. So for some low-risk activities where, whereby the, the excavator may be excavating to a very shallow depth, they're using, um, using a means that, uh, that's not very, um, uh, that, that has very little potential for damage uh, or to, to our plant. Uh, we would pre basically pre-approve those and allow the contractors to go ahead and do the work, provided they uh, they applied for an, a road occupancy permit to do that work. So essentially, this this uh, these ALAs, as they're they're called, would allow staff to be more efficient, allows uh, the utilities to be more efficient, and uh, it, it avoid it would uh, help the town to avoid countless hours of uh, of administration and field work. 
Thank you. We have uh, two recommendations uh, before us. Uh, one is to receive and the other is to authorize the general manager uh, to execute the agreements. Has someone move those? Councillor Crone. Is there any questions on this one? Seeing none, all in favor? That's carried. And lastly, uh, we have staff bringing back a report on the summer uh, mosquito control. Uh, Mr. Molinari, can you take us through that, please? Certainly, Madam Chair. Um, through the budget process, uh, there was some questions with regards to uh, potentially expanding the mosquito control program to include a, a summer program. Uh, and, and due to uh, budget uh, concerns, uh, that extended enhanced system or program was, uh, was not approved by Council and with the provision that we would return uh, mid-year or so or, or with, uh, with potential savings in hand in order to fund the program. Um, unfortunately, you know, we're just in September at, or in uh, February at this point and there, we haven't really been through 2020 sufficiently to uh, actually obtain full savings for this, but there's still lots of time left in the year for that to happen. And we also have another funding source that we could potentially use. Um, proceeding with the enhanced program, uh, we could certainly come back to Council with some data on its effectiveness and, uh, and, and Council would have the opportunity to be able to uh, determine if, uh, based on the data, if that's something that they wanted to continue on with in future years. So at this point, I, I think it would make sense to proceed with it and uh, staff are just uh, coming back to Council to uh, obtain some, some feedback and direction. Thank you very much. Uh, the only resolution we have before us is to receive, but staff are asking um, that we endorse a pilot and uh, um, instruct them to report back. So, um, Mr. Um, Clerk, do you have those? I um, reached out to you earlier today about uh, supplementary uh, recommendations that uh, are in line with this report. Okay, thank you. Let everyone just take a read of that. Thank you. I think uh, Council would probably like the word pilot put in there. Mm -hmm. And then we would need a further um, motion to have it ratified tonight. Can I have someone to move those three? Councillor Crone. Any discussion? Mayor Haxon. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, staff. Uh, I do recall that this was coming back uh, when we had uh, certainty that we did have uh, savings. And I have a concern that we're, we don't have certainty of savings. Um, and I, until we do, I, I can't support uh, this coming forward. I was quite sure that that was the wording of it in, in advance, and I think that's been, been uh, v validated here, so uh, I will not be supporting it. Thank you. Is there any other comments? <laughs> Councillor Roy DiClemente. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair. I, I'm of the same opinion as, as Mayor Haxon. Uh, if we don't have the money to do it this year, then uh, it shouldn't be done. Uh, if we want to save the money in 2020 and then bring it forward in 2021, I'm happy to consider it then, but I'm not, uh, I'm not interested in supporting it at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and staff are doing their due diligence, uh, and you're correct, Madam Mayor, that they said they would bring it back when there was savings, but now that we are facing uh, the deadline, um, it was prudent for them to bring it through. Um, so we have three... Um, motions before us. Uh, hearing uh, what my colleagues are saying, I'm going to ask to separate them. We'll just vote on receipt to begin with. All in favor of receipt? Thank you. Uh, and then the last two uh, to move ahead with the pilot program uh, and that it be ratified tonight. All in favor? Those opposed? That is not carried. Thank you. And that is all that I have. Uh, Mr. Molinari, do you have anything else? Uh, nothing further at this time. Thank you. Any uh, questions or comments from the committee on CIES issues? Councillor Roy DiClemente. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, at our last Committee of the Whole, uh, I think we were discussing uh, a stockpile of uh, topsoil on uh, one of the uh, local um, subdivision areas. And uh, Mr. Molinari did do some research and got back to us and said that that stockpile would be uh, potentially in, in place for, quote, several years. Uh, this is a, a uh, directly adjacent to uh, existing residents' uh, properties. Uh, they've been asking when it's going to be removed, and uh, uh, having an answer of a couple of months or another another season was was uh, perhaps acceptable to them. But uh, not having an end date uh, and it being adjacent to you know families who have small children who might potentially be climbing on there and so on. I'm just wondering if there's anything in our toolbox that can. Uh, uh, expedite having those stockpiles removed and in future when stockpiles are being established uh, whether we can have some mind to phasing and uh, and how long those those piles of dirt will be in place and so I just wanted to raise that here and uh, see if there's something that we could do about it. Mr. Molinari. Sure, Madam Chair. Um, the, uh, the stockpiles are generally created at the beginning of the earthworks process, whereby uh, all, the, all the, the topsoil is placed uh, on site so that it can be reused uh, on site later on, as opposed to having trucks come in and carting the material off site and then, and then again carting material back onto site uh, in the future when it's, uh, when it's required. The unfortunate part is that you know the the earthworks is the first part of the project and installing the topsoil is the last part of the project so given the uh, the number of years that it takes to go from the earthworks to uh, finally finishing the housing construction and, and installing the the topsoil back on the properties and sodding them um, it, there is a there are there there is a number of years that it takes in order to go through that process uh, to eliminate some of that work would mean uh, you know where we can installing stockpiles in areas where uh, where it may not be as noticeable to the community or or blend in a little bit better with the community, but in certain cases whereby the uh, the developments are are um, where there isn't an opportunity to do that, unfortunately the stockpile uh, needs to be there until it can be used in the future. I think one of the things we can do is is look at at potential opportunities to reuse that topsoil in other locations uh, where it makes sense to do so. But uh, it's one of those items that's um, it's, it's a necessary part of the development process. And, and the best way to do that, um, I, I, we're trying to do the best we can with that right now, but I, I don't know that there's much more that we can do with that at this time. Thank you. Any other questions? Continue. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. We've cr this, this is having a significant community impact. It's a safety issue. It's an aesthetic issue. Uh, not only is that particular stockpile in the way, there's also a giant stockpile on the site of the future health and active living plaza. If we plan to break, break ground, we can't have a stockpile sitting there for quote unquote several years. So uh, I'd like to, to find a way to address this sooner rather than later. We can't just be, be complacent as far as I'm concerned in accepting that. I know that uh, just a few hundred meters south of this particular stockpile, another developer had a commercial topsoil operation going on for most of the spring la and summer last year, uh, which was perhaps not necessarily the best idea, but it certainly uh, helped address some of the concerns about having stockpile. So I'd like to see us get creative and find a way to have it moved. Uh, if, if it takes residents coming into the chamber and telling us how they don't want their kids uh, climbing on the stockpile of dirt, how they don't want to look at it through their bedroom windows, uh, then, then we can do that. But I think we, it behooves us to, to try to find a way to address that sooner rather than later. I, I agree, and uh, I know that the stockpiles of topsoil um, in the past have prevented schools from being built um, at ideal locations and had to uh, go to different locations because of, of, of that. So I think it, it's uh, a problem on, on many levels. Madam Mayor. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I too, I find it offensive, quite frankly. Uh, I realize that um, it's a evolution of stripping it off, waiting, and the very last thing is putting it back on. <laughs> However, um, the one that we're talking about in particular, it was probably one of the first streets that was occupied. 
Uh, it's not like it was placed somewhere that later on, uh, it was towards the end of the completion of the subdivision. It was, it was pretty much near the beginning. Uh, and the size of it, it, it's not in a, um, they've not used up a great deal of their own land. Uh, in that it is high and and uh, very very large as opposed to uh, a flatter area and and I have actually uh, been at the home uh, taking a look out their back door and uh, they're looking directly at uh, topsoil um, I think it's it's I think it's poor for for the developer and uh, that that has planned this subdivision without a place to put the topsoil. I don't remember ever having issues like this in the past. Uh, however, we have more growth now than we did in the past, so perhaps that's just a symptom of, of something that we have. But um, I think it needs a creative solution, and I'm not sure what it is. I'm, I'm not the expert in that field, but uh, if we can come with some creative solution, particularly for for that street, but it's if it's happening at this on this street in Sharon, it's probably happening in other uh, areas of our community as well with the with the growth as well. So it may be just uh, if if we can sort it out now rather than sorting it out a few years from now, um, might be the right thing to do. Thank you, uh, and I agree. Uh, I think we can look to some of our neighbors to the south. Um, when I mentioned the school board issues with with uh, with topsoil, um, I think we could. I know that there was problems for a few years, and then those problems went away. So the developers were told they couldn't be stockpiling uh, the way they had in the past, and uh, things were changed, and we didn't have those problems anymore. So I'm thinking there is solutions out there. Um, could we get a um, motion to ask staff to report back on both this um, current uh, issue with, with the, the stockpiling at these two sites as well as um, direction for moving forward, how we're going to avoid this in the future? Councillor Roy DiClemente. You, you I'll, I'll make that motion. Thank you. Any further comments? Any further comments from staff on this? All in favor? Any opposed? That's carried. Thank you. Uh, is there any further comments from anyone under CIES? Seeing none, I'll turn the chair back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're under item H with Community Parks, Recreation, and Culture with Councillor Persicini in the chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have no reports at this time. Uh, General Manager Commerson, do you have any reports or any news or any anything at all to update us? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, nothing at this time. Thank you. Bring it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> we are at F with Development Services and Councillor Cronin, the Chair. No. Oh, wrong page. Item I with co Corporate Services with Councillor Morton in the Chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. <laughs> we do have uh, two recommendations uh, under uh, our uh, under my chair today, and uh, if I could get a motion to uh, move ahead to discuss on this, please, Councillor Crone. Um, the corporate services is uh, the construction of a new, it continu continues to um, construction of a new uh, pedestrian bridge integrated with the wing foot development trails plan to be received and secondly that staff be authorized to reimburse winged food for uh, blah, 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 winged foot development incorporated and valley brook investments inc directly for the construction of a pedestrian bridge from outdoor recreation development charges as described within this report mr valchich are you speaking to this uh, Madam Chair, I can just provide some brief uh, contextual comments and uh, between uh, finance staff and, and Mr. Karmazin's uh, group, we can answer any questions you might have on the project. This one, just to be clear, um, is a little bit different than sometimes uh, the finance uh, reports will speak to DC credit agreements. This one uh, is, uh, is different than that in that it's not a DC credit agreement, but it is a town capital project. Uh, proposed to be funded from development charges. And so I just wanted to point out that uh, distinction and uh, we're happy to uh, answer any questions you might have. 
Councillor. Uh, thank you. Um, this is something that um, residents have been asking for uh, for a long time, so I'm glad to see that it's um, getting underway. Um, when I look at the price tag, um, I'm shocked. Uh, I understand we want to put in a bridge that's not going to be washed out um, like the last one was. Um, but when I look at the wooden bridge, the picture of the, the previous wooden bridge, and then see that we're um, going to be asking our um, residents for what equates to a 1% on our tax base uh, to reinstall this pedestrian bridge. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to stop it, but I think that the price tag is outrageous um, when it's replacing a small wooden footbridge. Uh, I understand that we're dealing with um, land owned by, or we have conservation authority guidelines we have to pass and that sort of thing, but um, is there anything we can do about this price tag? Because uh, it, it's a lot of money. Mr. Carmison. Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, engineered, engineered uh, bridge crossings um, uh, do have a, a price tag associated with them. Uh, they, they do, uh, are, they are built with um, a significant amount of integrity as far as their stormwater management conveyance. I think um, the timber structure was evidence that, um, that those types of structures will fail. Um, with certain stormwater management, or sorry, with certain stormwater events, um, we this is an estimate at this point in time. We we will be facilitating a, a, a public procurement process uh, through the developer that mirrors our our procurement process, where we do tender all of our projects to seek competitive pricing. Our hopes are that 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 pricing could uh, come down, uh, but keep in mind it is a an enhanced um, bridge structure, a much larger bridge structure for stormwater management purposes and safe uh, pedestrian uh, crossing across that tributary of the, uh, the Holland River. Be happy to answer any other questions. Thank you, if I may. Um, is a larger bridge warranted? Um, the existing footbridge, um, I understand, uh, was used by a few residents, um, but we're not talking about uh, a major bridge um, connecting uh, communities. Um, I also see there's a consulting and permit fees of $56,000, which to me for a small footbridge seems a little bit out of line. Can I have some information on why those permitting fees would be so high? enough to pay for a mosquito program for the whole summer. <laughs> Mr. Carmen. Through you, Madam Chair, the permit fees uh, take the form of a couple of different uh, items. Uh, number one is to pay a uh, structural engineer to uh, study the alignment of the bridge. Uh, and the bridge does include, again, uh, some footings, so abutments, so to dig down uh, to provide a con concrete foundation for the, fo for the footbridge. Uh, and then it requires a metal structure. And then, uh, so that does require uh, design and consulting fees. Uh, once the design and consulting uh, is complete, then a, um, a permit to the LSRCA is also required. And there's a significant amount of consulting that uh, is involved with that process as well to ensure that the bridge is placed in the, in the correct area and then as well to ensure that it's designed with the, uh, with the vigor that's required uh, for certain stormwater management events, uh, taking into consideration uh, the, the location of the bridge. Uh, so there is actually quite a bit of behind the scenes uh, work that is done uh, by a consulting and engineering team in order to, to provide a safe uh, uh, bridge crossing. Thank you. Um, I'll just end by saying, uh, first of all, I uh, don't agree with the size of the project, that I think it's out of line for, the, for what uh, is needed in this area. Um, but I am happy that it's going ahead. I, this is an item I get uh, numerous calls and emails about, uh, and I, I'm happy that it is going ahead uh, despite the price tag. Uh, can we just get a date on when uh, we might have a ribbon cutting there? 
Uh, through you, Madam Chair, uh, the uh, goal is to have the bridge installed for the summertime. Uh, so we're uh, we, we've, uh, we're at a point where the bridge design uh, is complete. We have uh, a uh, design in front of the LSRCA and we have their conditional approval. And uh, once uh, we have an, uh, an approval by council, we can proceed uh, to tender, award the uh, project for a spring and early summer uh, completion. Wonderful. And thanks again for all your work on this project. Thank you, Mr. Carmerson. Other questions from members of the committee? Councillor Roy DiClemente. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, just um, uh, a comment that this is actually a key piece of uh, active transportation and trails master plan infrastructure that uh, uh, we had an informal piece of infrastructure in place and it was insufficient. And, and while the use may have been modest in the past, uh, Winged Foot is, is putting a whole bunch of, of new homes in the area and this will be their main way of, of accessing our community center uh, through the trail, the trail network that they are being obliged to construct on their site. So I think uh, while it's expensive, uh, it is, it's necessary, and, and I'm happy to see it moving forward, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions? Hearing none, all in favor of the motion? Motion's carried. <clears throat> Mr. Valchitz, do you have anything further to discuss under corporate services? Nothing further, uh, Madam Chair. Thank you. Okay. I turn the chair back to you and then Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're under item J, Emergency and Community Safety Services with Councillor Roy D. Clementi in the chair. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, there are no prepared items on our agenda. Uh, Deputy Chief, do you have anything to bring forward? I have nothing to bring forward, thank you. Uh, members of committee, anything to raise? Seeing none, I'll turn the chair back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're under administration with myself in the chair. We have no prepared reports at this time. Mr. Velchik, is there anything uh, in your acting capacity? Uh, nothing uh, to, um, to bring forward at this point, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we will move to item L, and that's legal and counsel support services with Councillor Foster in the chair. Thank you, Madam Mayor. We have nothing on the agenda today. Uh, Mr. Horner, is there anything from you? Uh, nothing to report, Mr. Chair, but happy to take any questions. Anything from committee? Seeing none, I'll turn it back to you, Madam Mayor. Thank you very much. We're at item M, and that is other business. And the first item of other business is the East Gwilinberry Public Library Memo, Acting Library CEO Appointment. Uh, and as we know, our uh, CEO is going on mat leave shortly, and uh, there needs to be an appointment of an acting CEO. I have a mover for that, please, Councillor Roy De Clemente. Any questions? All those in favor? And that's carried. Item number two is work workshop topics, March the 10th, and uh, the street naming. Policy is listed on that. I believe there was uh, someone from council had asked for that, and I think it's always uh, an opportunity for all members of council to to be refreshed on the naming and how we go about it, because uh, it certainly is a topic out in the community, particularly the new residents who want to know the street that they're living on, what is the significance in in our municipality. So we will uh, be having that shortly on March the tenth. And with that, I'm not seeing any other business. And so I will ask for an adjournment at 212, moved by Councillor Crone. All those in favor? And that's carried.